Okay, thank you all for coming. I'm Summer, I'm the curator here at the museum. Before we get started, everybody please take a second to turn off or silence your cell phones so we don't have any disruptions. Um, as for announcements, on Sunday, February 13th, we are having a Victorian tea in celebration of Valentine's Day. Contact Fia if you would like to purchase tickets. Um, her card is at that back table by the door. Um, we will be having both our cottages and courtyards tour and our annual golf tournament coming up in April. Um, so be on the lookout for upcoming information about these events. As for upcoming programs, for our February brown bag lunch on February 2nd, we will have John Pulsinelli who will speak about his upcoming book, St. Michael's Parish, which details the history of St. Michael's Church. And then for our February 3rd on 3rd, on the 18th, we'll have Jada Wright Green speak about her book, Florida's African American Homes, which features the homes of individuals like A.L. Lewis of American Beach and Mary McLeod Bethune. Um, also, if you have an evaluation sheet at your seat, please take a second after the program to fill it out and then return it to the basket at okay, that back table by the door. <laughs> Um, so that's it for announcements, but tonight we have Dickie Anderson. Dickie is a freelance writer and popular speaker living on Amelia Island. Her weekly column, From the Porch, appears in the Fernandina Beach Newsleader. Her articles on the people and history of Amelia Island are also featured in regional publications. Her latest book, Great Homes and Churches, Architectural Treasures of Amelia Island, is an expanded version of her earlier book, Great Homes of Fernandina, profiling nine historic churches in addition to 25 historic homes in Fernandina. Anderson's commitment to her community is evident. She currently coordinates a pet therapy program for the Council on Aging. She has volunteered at the Amelia Island Museum of History, has served on the boards of the Amelia Arts Academy and the Amelia Island Chamber Music Festival, and served as executive director of the Amelia Book Island Festival. So everyone, please welcome Dick. I appreciate that. Um, first, I want there. I, we have a nine-year-old birthday in the back of the room. So happy birthday! So I'm the lucky one. I don't have to wear a mask for another 45 minutes. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm just thrilled to see uh, see so many people tonight. Um, I have been involved in the museum since 1996, before Phyllis. <laughs> That's how long ago it was. And my passion for the historic district and these books that I've written, this is, we call it the old book and the new book. And Jennifer's downstairs if anyone wants to buy uh, one of these books that I'm talking about tonight. So uh, a little bit about my passion for this museum. Um, I moved here, didn't know anybody, and immediately wanted to learn about the community I'd moved into and I signed up for the docent training. And you know what a docent is? We docent get paid. <laughs> That's my standard docent joke. Um, so I took the training uh, I, it was a dear friend of mine and Caroline Atwood, Susan Little, who doesn't live here anymore, but she was a taskmaster and we really learned our history and we had to get up in front of people and practice. Well, I found my favorite period of history was the late 1800s and early 1900s, and the houses that we are so lucky to have. I always call it a living museum because there are not many places you can go where you can actually see the houses in their original state. Now, I'll tell you a little bit how that came about. I do want to thank Phyllis, everybody in this museum, then and now, has been tremendously helpful to me. You may not know there is an archive that is just a treasure trove of information. And when I added the churches, it was a little hard to find some of the information about the churches because it kept changing. With every new minister, there's a new, uh, kind of a new history. But uh, uh, Rhonda and I dug and found some information. And I understand from Thea that there are, is going to be a church 
tour added probably in the fall. And the more I found out about the churches, it is an amazing part of our history. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. When I did the research on the book, I became curious about why we still have these houses. Most communities, as they evolve, houses are torn down or sold or changed or renovated. That didn't happen here. And there was a reason. There are two other places that I found that had the same thing happen to them. One is Galveston, Texas, and one is Mystic, Connecticut. So what do these three places have in common? Galveston, Texas used to be the main port for Texas. But frequent visits by hurricanes caused a change. They moved the port. The economy was gone. If anybody's been to Galveston, there are beautiful Victorian homes in Galveston. So we go to Mystic, Connecticut. Mystic, Connecticut was the home of all the whaling ships that brought the oil in for the oil lamps. What happened? Electricity. So that town went to sleep as well. So we have three communities where there were not changes. They couldn't afford to make changes. There wasn't any new economy to replace the lost economies. So why, what woke us up to continue to preserve these houses? Some, who remembers the Keystone Hotel? Oh, <laughs> I mean, there used to be a hotel across from St. Peter's Episcopal Church that was built in 1910, and it was a very popular hotel. Old timers tell me they remember proms and dances and parties, but it became outmoded and they couldn't find a use for it. And overnight it was torn down, and it scared people. It scared people that that could happen, that we could lose something valuable that easily. So many groups of people got together, evolved, and said, we've got to do something to protect our historic district. So in 1973, the his original historic district was defined and uh, recognized by the National Registry of Historic Homes. Now, I think many people think the signs that we see mean they're protected. Someone's protecting them and nothing can happen to them. That is not true. The registry recognizes the house has his historic significance. And it's not easy to get that recognition. I remember when the jailhouse that we're in tonight went through their application. Um, there are all kinds of things that have to be documented and um, shared with those that approve it. So what happens then is if you have historic preservation properties, the city and the community has to take the responsibility to protect those buildings. So we have uh, an historic district council. These people are appointed by our city commission and there are five regular members and two aldermen. And they are the ones that make the decisions as to whether or not any change can be made to a, a recognized historic property. I did notice recently, I thought it was interesting, that the city has recognized three new historic properties. Uh, one is the standard marine building down uh, on the harbor. And uh, they've recognized next to Beach Street G Grill, there are three no, I guess there are four or five now, <laughs> little shops that were part of the evolution of that block. They've been recognized, and uh, one of the uh, African churches can recognize. And that means that they'll be protected by the city, and I understand also there are some tax advantages or recognition um, for that. Okay, Summer, we'll see if I can. So this is the sign at the top of Center Street, and this is something we're all very, very proud of. The museum celebrates this all the time, and any of you that have not 
tour the museum since its renovation should do it. And then there are highly detailed tours uh, where you can see in detail these properties, the Living Museum. And then in, later on, we're going to have a church one. This is in both books, in the first book and the second book. Um, I have a map, so you can do a walking tour or a driving tour. And the reason that I put this up is that you can see here is Center Street, Date Street, Alachua. You can see how many historically important buildings are in a very, very small area. So many of you know the history of David Uly. Uh, he made a huge difference in our geography and in our community. After the Civil War, this town was booming. I, I kind of dragged some of you before or pointed out the print that I brought in. I love this print because I think it freezes in time uh, what was going on in the late 1800s. The map, or the map, the chart is 1883. And it shows a river full of ships. Everything in the economy in those days was moved by water. Water, the rivers were the roads of, the, of that time. And then we had the uh, emerging railroad. You probably know the first railroad was conceived and built by David Uly. In his wisdom, uh, he, in his wisdom, in his, his need for power and change, he decided to move an entire community. What we call Old Town now was the original Fernandina. But he decided and felt that because of the marsh, it would, it would be uh, problematic for the railroad he wanted to build. So he convinced the citizens to move, and he sold them their land. One thing that I learned when I was researching the churches is part of what he did he planned, the, planned it and platted it very carefully. He recognized that our island is almost exactly the same size as Manhattan. So we have a central park, and we have things that are reminiscent of New York City. And one thing he did is he recognized the importance of houses of worship in a community. So he made land available for those groups that wanted to form and found or develop a church. And that's why we have our churches in what is very valuable property, but it's integrated into our community. And that was part of David Uly's um, dream. So why Victorian architecture? Why, why do we have this period of 40 years or less, these houses being built? One thing I discovered, which was fascinating to me, is in Philadelphia in um, 1876, there was a centennial celebration. And it was actually the first World's, uh, World's, World's Fair. And it was kind of a celebration and recognition of the industrial age, all the changes that were happening around the world. And it was also during the time when Victoria was queen, and there was a great fascination with things fussy and ornate, detailed, and the buildings that were built for that exhibition were very much of the Victorian style. And evidently, that was what they would say in this day and age, the influencers that were there recognized that. And so you began to see the impact of Victorian period architecture. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Victorian architecture. I think many people, when I take people on tours and spend time talking about the houses, Victorian, there isn't a Victorian house, a Victorian architecture. There's Victorian era architecture. So within that period, you can find Gothic, Italianate, all different variations. Um, when you look at 
the criteria in, in determining a house is Victorian, I found this list, which I thought was a good one. They're two to three stories high. They're made of wood or stone. They are asymmetrical. What is fascinating, the longer you stand in front of a Victorian era house, the more details you'll see. There is texture involved. You'll see a variety of shingles and woodwork and fretwork, all kinds of things going on in Victorian period houses. They usually have very steep roof roofs uh, or mansard roofs. They mostly have porches. And of course, we know why we have porches because before air conditioning and people staying inside, they would go to their porches to cool off. Uh, they often have towers or turrets. This house is probably one of the, the most famous and one that you're, you're uh, familiar with. This is the Fairbanks house. And typical of house builders or owners, this house was built by a very, uh, a, a very an amazing man, a Renaissance man. He had groves of orange trees. He was the first editor of the uh, what is now the news leader, the Times Mirror, and he was a historian. He was, I think, the president of the first state of Florida historical society. He was a veteran of the Civil War. And this house he built had amazing details, and they're ones that he uh, specified. He worked with an architect named Robert Sands Schuyler, and I'll mention his name and tell you a little more about him later. So the house was designed with a lot of the things that I've just mentioned. This is an Oreo window. You have these porches and galleries, a tower, and uh, always a variety of colors. Sometimes people will go to areas where they're Victorian homes and they'll say, oh my gosh, that's turquoise and pink. But in that period, they did paint houses in jewel tones. And anybody that's a painter or an artist will tell you that different colored paints have different prices. I mean, if you buy oil paint, a cobalt blue will cost more than a, a crimson red or whatever. So part of the detail in these houses was competitive. So the more detail in your house and the more colors, the more prestigious you were. So that was part of um, the concept. This house is in wonderful shape thanks to the people that have taken care of it through the years. It has, if you ever tour it or stay there, it's a bed and breakfast, it has, the wood has kind of a orangey aura because it's all orange wood from uh, George Fairbanks. Uh, groves. They used to say it had an elevator. Well, we call it a dumb waiter. I don't think any of us could fit in the elevator. Um, it had the first telephone, and they laughed because a lot of people will laugh because the Fairbanks had many, many children in their household, and the doctor lived down the street, and they said the phone was connected to the doctor's house because they were always calling the doctor. Um, the one story, it's funny, when, when you take the docent training and you hear lots of stories, and when I, when I take people on tours, I will tell them stories. They're not necessarily factual, but they're stories that have evolved through the years that are fun and do reflect uh, something about the story. So the story we often tell is that when George Fairbanks married his second wife, she was not in town when he had this house built. And evidently, the story goes, when she came to see the house, she, she was appalled. She was a very modest woman, and she just thought, this is just over the top. And so it became nicknamed uh, Fairbanks Folly. So it may be true, it may, it may not be, but it's certainly a grand, grand house. It, at one point, through the history, some of the Victorian houses we treasure now uh, were boarding houses for a while. The uh, Florida house was a boarding house. This was a boarding house. And then the interest in bed and breakfast brought back the commitment to get these houses back up and to take care of them.
The arrow, the arrow. Oh, this is the Bailey House, and this is considered even nationally one of the best examples of a Queen Anne. This is the style. The Fairbanks House is Italianate. Typically, Italianate period or, uh, um, houses are very are very uh, vertical rather than horizontal. This has it all going. Everything I mentioned. You see the different windows, very elaborate chimneys, wraparound porch is typical of a Queen Anne house. And what is interesting, when we first moved here, this was a very, very popular bed and breakfast. <laughs> and you can't see that much of it, but the house was here. And they added a whole other section and it was one of the most incredible additions that mirrored all the details that were in the, ori in the original house. And I remember talking to uh, Barbara Sheffield, I think, who bought the house after it was a bed and breakfast. And the people that owned it left all the towels and the soap and, <laughs> and all the stuff for them. So she said she had played plenty of that. Now this one, next one, now, this was an architect designed house. Most, I'm, I was interesting, I pulled the architect designed houses. Most of the houses here in town were built by a builder. His last name was Mann, and the owner would say, I want this and this and this, and they would build the house. Whoop. This is the Tabby house, and I just think it's it intrigues me. It's one of the most interesting houses. This is uh, Robert Sand Schuyler, again, architect. And he was kind of his signature with it were these very, very fussy fretwork and galleries. If you all are familiar with the Williams house, that house was pre-Civil War. But after the Civil War, Schuyler designed the galleries that are on the front of the house. And evidently, they the owners had to sign an agreement they wouldn't let anyone copy the exact uh, design and prep work there. What's interesting about this house is it's made out of tabby. And if you look very closely, you can see their lines. And it was a popular building strategy. And what they did is they used the oyster shells that were in mounds left by the Indians and mixed it up with cement. Then they would pour it into a form, let it harden, then they'd move the form up and do it again. So you can see the oyster shells uh, and all of that. Typical in this period are these elaborate chimneys. So most of the Victorian houses you're going to see, well, I see one, two, three, four chimneys from this side. And the Fairbanks house also has many, many chimneys. Now we're going to move on to the churches. So this is a new part of the book. When we decided to reprint the book, I um, wanted to add the churches because I do think they're an important part of the history. And as Thea will tell you, a lot of these churches are celebrating major anniversaries. Um, they've been around for a long time, and uh, they want to celebrate their birthdays. I was asking uh, Susie Kowicki about the red roof. I think we've all been watching the red roof being repaired and fixed, and it's, it's being done. Now this has interesting things going on. I keep mentioning Robert Sands Schuyler. He was quite an interesting man. He was from New York, very well educated, and a very, very religious man. And he first came to Florida to build churches. So there are churches, uh, there's one in Jacksonville, and there are churches in other communities that are very typical of his style, very ornate and always Gothic. And there is a style called Gothic Carpenter. So you're very aware of the wood and kind of the carpentry that's involved. He designed the church, um, oh, what is the church off island? St. Anne's? The Episcopal Church. Oh, I can't think of the name of it. St. George's Island. St. George's Thank you. Thank you. Carol. He designed that church. And that's a beautiful little church if you ever get to see it. So this has uh, 
architect architects will describe it as perfect proportions, arched windows, a pitched roof, buttressed walls, a tower, and a castellated parapet. <laughs> um, it also had part of the church's kind of signature of each individual church are the stained glass windows. And the stained glass windows in this church really tell the story of Fernandina during the late 1800s and 1900s. The names on the windows and all of that are wonderful, wonderful <laughs> stories. Oh, we were not going to do that one. This is Missionary Baptist Church. I, 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 I had another substitute. This is a beautiful, beautiful church. And it's very simple, and it was built to accommodate the congregation at the time. This is Trinity Methodist. We have two Methodist church, churches within three blocks of each other. This one is the oldest. This dates back to 1891. And it is a two-story masonry building. has lancet arched windows. It has um, a square tower. And it has very interesting windows. If you go in, they're very milky. It's, it's a very unique style of stained glass window. And these windows come, came from England. As an example of our community's dedication to preserving historic properties, in 1997, right after I moved here, uh, I got to know a woman, Susan Little, many of you may remember her, and she's very passionate about the history. She did my docent training, and she was in this church one day and was sitting there, and she looked at one of those stained glass windows and she said to the woman with her, who was a member of the church, it's your window's broken. And the person shared the fact that they had lots of problems, the bricks needed to be repaired. And Susan said, we're going to get this fixed. And they formed a group called Friends of Trinity. And the community got behind it. And they did an enormous amount of work getting the church back in, in, a, in a good state. The other Methodist church on Center Street Whoops. Well, I guess we didn't, we didn't get that. The brick, the big well, I thought we had the Methodist. Well, what I can go to Memorial. All right, we'll have time for questions sooner. Um, so, when I, Summer and I got together and talked about what we were going to call this and do it, I just find myself over and over again saying we have a living museum. And it's, I never fail to be in awe of, I'll be on 7th Street or one of the streets and, um, and I'll look up and think, I live here. This is just, this is just wonderful. So the books were written oh, to give. Memorial. Oh. <laughs> Good for you, girl. <laughs> this church um, is interesting. It, it is a Greek revival, and it is a church that's not one of the oldest churches on the island, but the Methodists are one of the oldest congregations on the island. The first Methodist minister in East Florida uh, had his congregation meet in Old Town. So on the 100th anniversary of the Methodists coming to Fernandina, they built this Brit, uh, this um, this church. So this is very very classic. These are unfluted columns and a big portico. It's a very uh, impressive church when you look up and walk down Center Street. So I think that does it. So I will be glad to take questions. 
<laughs> that looks more Georgian than it does Victorian. It's not Victorian. It's This church is one of the churches included. Most of what is in this book is Victorian, but when I did the churches, they're not all Victorian. This one is not Victorian. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, this church. And you said this one was 100 years after Methodism came to the island. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And was Old Town established? Because you, you know, if you look, it says 1562, I guess, was when Fernandina was settled. So was that when Old Town was first settled? Yeah, it is the, uh, um, Jennifer Harrison will tell you it's the oldest Spanish platted town in this hemisphere, right? Well, Spanish town, platted in the western and the New World. In the New World. Okay. So that origin uh, was Spanish. So older than St. Augustine. Um, some people say that. <laughs> Probably, you know, you usually, yeah, you usually hear St. Augustine as being the oldest. Yeah. So that's why I was asked. They had more going down there. <laughs> Carolyn, was there something interesting personally that happened at the Fairbanks house? I know. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't, haven't put the plaque up, but a uh, big guy and I were married there on 1997. Yep. Yes, the Harrisons. <laughs> you, you spoke about the stained glass windows in St. Peter's. Yes. Do you think that when the church was first built, there were stained glass windows in there, or did they simply evolve? as people wanted to memorialize their relatives as they passed. Um, St. Peter's, the, ch the, the picture that I showed you is not really the original Episcopal church, um, but that church was the church of the well-to-do and the wealthy, and, and the stained glass windows were part of, part of the concept of the church. And one of the stories that they that we tell as docents is that there was a fire that they think was started by arson, and the windows were badly damaged, and uh, they managed to get the stained glass people to replace the windows just as they were for the same price. <laughs> so, but um, one thing again, I think it's this community and their commitment to history. Anytime you want to walk in St. Peter's Episcopal Church and enjoy the solitude and quiet and look at the windows, it is a wonderful, wonderful time out. So take, if you haven't done it, take time to do it. Yes? I have a question with regards to that red brick roof. Obviously, it hasn't always been red metal. Was it tile previously? Or? I was asking Susie, so cool. what, do you know the... I think it, they, Susie was saying that they can't duplicate the original because the artisans or whatever don't exist. Um, it almost looks like metal to me, but I don't know. It's a tin roof. It is a tin I think it was. It was only a tin roof. Yes. I'm puzzled by the role of the historic district council. Um, do they have wide latitude in approving plans for new construction? Uh, it seems to me as though most of the new construction is either very limited because of lot size, and so we have some very strange homes being built, <laughs> or on the larger lots, it is almost all low country style, which is not really in the spirit of the historic the district. The um, only the only power they have is on historic uh, historic structures. Okay. So I think the only uh, those houses have to be zoning has to be approved and all of that, but. Jennifer, do you know? Are there? Well, you have two HPC members right here, one here, and one back here. Yeah. So that is, his question is, uh, the, these new modern contemporary uh, structures, is there any control approval? Yes. Yeah, first of all, the, the control is not so much over the buildings themselves, it's over the historic districts. Um, 
the property and the lots that exist within the historic districts. And uh, new construction or modifications to existing construction in the historic district have to meet the requirements of the uh, National Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation for historic structures. Um, the, the other thing I'd like to add is that um, the properties themselves uh, are, are not inducted, as it were, into the historic district by the city. The property owners themselves have to ask to be included. And so on this latest go around, uh, it was the property owners, the Standard Marine, and the uh, cottages. Yes, they, they asked to be included in the historic district, and that was just <coughs> been approved by the city. So they would do that for market value, but there's also a tax advantage? I'm not aware of the, Well, uh, Sue Ann Tam wrote, I guess, the, the article that I read. Um, so I was curious to see all of a sudden properties added. So. Um, Mike and Jennifer live in Old Town, and they have very specific uh, uh, requirements in the properties there. What is it? Pisa what is the, the Peonia? Peonia? Back to the Spanish. Yeah, Their the, the, lots are the, the not like building. our lots. <laughs> yeah, the, the basic building lot is 46 and a half feet by 93 feet, which presents challenges of its own. <laughs> and, and that is a, a number of Spanish bazaars, B A R A. And a bar is about 33.4 inches, very useful. So anyway, we, we settle on 46.6 uh, by 93 feet. It's, it's a rectangle. Uh, that's the basic building lot. You have to have at least that amount of land to, uh, to build a house on. And that was called a payonia because it was the amount of land that was awarded to a peon, we'd say a peon, I think. Peon. Yeah. <laughs> was uh, a, a Spanish foot soldier involved in the conflict. Um, Jennifer, I, I pointed people to my print, and I showed them the walkway from Old Town to Newtown. And what's happened with that? <laughs> um, well, um, Back in um, 1870, the, uh, when the new town was built, um, the ladies who lived who still remained in Old Town, a lot of them were captain's wives and they, they missed socializing with their friends who had moved to the new town, and they raised $600, which is a lot of money back in 1870, and a boardwalk was built. Um, from South Point, the South Point of Bernardina, and we now have turned that into a little pocket park, and there are information signs there, and it connected up with Second um, Street in, in the new, new town of Bernardina. And we have photographs of um, these people um, walking along this very narrow wooden um, boardwalk um, from Old Town to go and um, see their friends do some shopping in the new town. Weren't you um, trying to work for the paper mill to have uh, a... Yes, we've been trying for years to, to recreate this. And any, any support that you would like to give to this cause would be great. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, there is, um, there's a paper mill there which we could circumvent. And then there's the port, which I believe, in talking to a passport director, there's an easement around the port, and it would be possible. But when we have so many lovely wooden boardwalks on the south end of the island, I think it would be fantastic to have one linking old town with downtown. It would. It would. Any other questions? Thank you for coming, and the. Book is downstairs if you want a copy, and I really appreciate your coming tonight. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you at the Brown Bag on February 3rd. Thank you, Vicki. Welcome.